laser pointer on the screen as well to help point out some things. Um, so my name is Lauren Perry. Uh, so as Jim said, I'm a recent graduate of UNLV with my doctorate in uh, paleontology. So I'm starting my new position as the guest scientist for Tule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument. And I wanted to discuss some of the science behind these Ice Age wetlands that we have preserved here in Las Vegas. So this program is a partnership through the National Park Service between several different agencies, including GSA, um, the um, Environmental Stewards Program uh, through Conservation League, and then also AmeriCorps. And so my principal role as a guest scientist is to work on the in-situ fossil monitoring program, but then I also have to do a lot of data management um, and also outreach like we're doing today. And because this is a fairly new national monument, there's a lot of things to prepare in planning the park. Uh, so we have to put all that stuff together to keep the ball rolling forward. And when I say fairly new national monument, you have to keep in mind too that a lot of national parks or other units of the park service across the country have been established for many, many years. Whereas Tule Springs Fossil Beds uh, was designated uh, a park by Congress in December of 2014. And so this is a fairly new national monument. We don't have any permanent infra infrastructure uh, on the land as of now, but we've still been able to do a lot of really cool things um, in the last almost six years or so. And so the National Monument is kind of a weird shape. You'll notice it has this kind of sawtooth pattern uh, that goes up into the northwest corner of this map. And that's because the National Monument follows the natural path of the upper Las Vegas wash. And so those are the, these tan colored sediments that I'm highlighting with my laser pointer here. Um, and so those are the sediments of the upper Las Vegas wash. And preserving this park, uh, the aim of it is to conserve, protect, enhance, and interpret late Pleistocene fossils, their geologic context, and then other scientific values that the uh, natural resources of the park has. And then also to use those tools um, through outreach and education and community collaboration and partnerships um, and appropriate public use to really make this a park for everyone in the city and whoever comes to visit uh, Las Vegas. And you'll notice too that it's right up against the boundaries of the city and development keeps going up to the edge of the boundary of the National Monument. So this is truly uh, our very own urban National Monument here in town. And so this is a view of Tule Springs on the ground. And you'll notice these kind of buff colored sort of rocks right here. And so those that's the geologic context that I was mentioning of Tule Springs Fossil Beds National Monument. This is called the Las Vegas Formation. So any unit of, of rock is called a formation in geology. Uh, this is sedimentary in nature, so it's not, uh, the origin is not through volcanic activity or any kind of metamorphic processes. These are sediments that accumulated um, through natural sedimentation processes. And these sediments range from about 500,000 to 8,500 years old. So this puts us in the Pleistocene epoch, which isn't really that long ago uh, relative to geologic time. And these, de excuse me, these deposits were originally interpreted as being deposited in a lake or lacustrine, um, but it turns out that that is not the case. And part of the reason for this interpretation initially is because there were actually very extensive um, lakes during the Pleistocene during uh, in um, Northern Nevada. And now they're much, much smaller where you would see Pyramid Lake and the Great Salt Lake. So that lake area has shrunk significantly over the last tens of thousands of years. So these deposits are actually um, they're from groundwater discharge deposits. So they were formed in desert wetlands and from desert springs. So not a lake, but more of groundwater discharge deposits. And everything that you see here on the ground where you don't see tan sediments, all of those sediments have been removed away through erosion, usually from things like just natural uh, water flow and storm activity. Uh, and so you'd call that badlands topography where you have that kind of undulating um, geography in the area. So putting us into the context of where we're at in the Pleistocene epoch, so the Pleistocene epoch as a whole took place from 2.6 million years ago till about 11,700 years ago. And so this was a much colder world uh, than we're used to today. So the average global temperature was lower by several degrees Celsius. 
And what is really fascinating about the end of the Pleistocene epoch, um, so around the time of 11,000, 12,000 years ago, you had over 30 genera of large-bodied mammals going extinct. And genera just means a, a plural of genus. So you had a lot of different uh, large-bodied mammal species going extinct between 12,000 and 10,000 years ago. And the two main hypotheses of what caused that um, extinction are either climate change at the end of the Pleistocene or human overkill, because humans weren't present in North America until a few thousand years before they went extinct. But to test any hypothesis in science, including in, in paleontology, you need data to test that hypothesis. Otherwise, you're just kind of imagining things. And so uh, one of the things that was really interesting to this human overkill hypothesis was in the 1950s, um, archaeologists and paleontologists started finding artifacts in association with Pleistocene animal bones. So this is a Clovis point highlighted with this red box in association with Ice Age animal bones. And so that was a really hot topic um, around the time of trying to figure out this relationship between humans and Ice Age animals. And uh, back up 20 years or so in 1932 to 1933, in Tule Springs, in that area, uh, an obsidian flake was found. And that's strange because obsidian flakes aren't really naturally occurring around the area. And so this kind of set off a red flag of, ooh, we might have this association between um, early humans in North America and then also Ice Age animals. So that was a big research question of were humans and Pleistocene animals living together in Southern Nevada? But in 1932, there wasn't really an accurate way to test the timing of that hypothesis because radiocarbon dating hadn't been invented yet. But uh, after the invention of radiocarbon dating uh, by Willard Libby, Tule Springs was actually selected as the site of the first time that radiocarbon dating was going to be used on a large scale in a research study. Uh, to test this hypothesis of were humans and Ice Age animals in temporal association with each other at this location in Southern Nevada. And so um, this was called the Tule Springs Expedition was this research study. It was an interdisciplinary study with many different scientists from different fields from all over the country. And one of the things that they did was they dug these huge trenches uh, to test into the sediments of Tule of Springs of the Las Vegas Formation. So they dug these huge trenches, um, and this is a man for scale, and uh, they were able to examine what's called the stratigraphy, which is just the relationship of the different layers of sediments um, to test this hypothesis. So today, those trenches have been filled in for safety purposes, um, but then they also, the edges of the walls tend to fall in, but you can still see these historic trenches um, within both the National Monument and also um, Ice Age Fossil State Park, which neighbors the National Monument. So here are some photos from the Tule Springs expedition uh, in the 1960s, also called the Big Dig, um, but I like calling it the Tule Springs expedition. And so there were a lot of fossils collected uh, during this expedition, including these are both metacarpal bones, which are part of the, in us it would be part of the foot, but in hoofed animals, it's part of their legs. And this is from a bison and a camel. There's also, um, this is a third upper molar of a Colombian mammoth, and this is the lower jaw of a species of horse that used to be here during the last Pleistocene. Um, and so ultimately it turned out that they didn't find any temporal association between humans and Pleistocene animals here in Tule Springs, um, but it was still really cool to have all of that data from that study because they were able to provide this geologic framework for all these different sediments in what's now known as the Las Vegas Formation. And that's remained pretty intact over the years. Uh, so about 40 years later, uh, you had scientists, mostly from at the time from the San Bernardino County Museum, now they're dispersed uh, into several different agencies, including the US Geological Survey. So they reinvestigated these deposits at Tule Springs because since they've been described, there have been a lot of advances in dating techniques um, and then also a lot of different um, climate data from the Pleistocene. And so this is Kathleen Springer. She's a researcher through the US Geological Survey and she was one of the people to help uh, characterize the stratigraphy of Tule Springs, including uh, figuring out all these new really interesting relationships uh, with climate. And so going back to where we're at in the Pleistocene here, uh, so it's important to note that 
North America looks very different in this reconstruction than it does today. So typically you only see ice sheets up in you know, the far Arctic regions of the, of the world today. So during the Pleistocene, you had glacial periods. And that's because Earth's orbit around the sun, there's natural variations over super long periods of time in the shape of that orbit and many other factors in Earth's orbit. And that basically determines how much direct sun is the Northern hemisphere getting during the summertime. And the reason why that's important is because if the Northern hemisphere is not getting a ton of direct sun during the summer, then that means that they have the potential to form these giant ice sheets. Because if the rate of melting of the ice is less than the rate of the ice formation, then you get to retain this ice year round. But if you're in an interglacial period and it might be a little bit warmer, you're receiving a lot more direct sun on the um, Northern hemisphere during the summertime, you start to melt that ice faster than it can accumulate. And then you start to have the ice sheets shrink. And part of the other reason why that's important is because during glacial periods, all this ice, this huge freezing cold sheet of ice on top of North America shifts a lot of weather patterns. And so all of the rain that you would see today in places like um, Portland or Seattle, all that rain got shifted down into the Southwest. And so we used to get almost as much rain as Seattle does today. And so all that rain is important here because more precipitation equals more recharge. And so um, here in Southern Nevada, some of you might be aware that we have uh, water underneath us underground. And so anytime it rains or snows on the surrounding mountain ranges around Las Vegas, like the Sheep Range or in the Spring Mountains, where those are all made out of limestone, it's very porous. So the rain soaks into the mountains and kind of trickles down into the rocks that form the surface of the valley and water collects underground between all the little pore spaces in the rock. So normally they're filled with air, but when rain and precipitation trickle down into those spaces, they get filled with water. And so the level of water underground is called the water table. So currently you probably have water under you right now. It just might be several feet under um, the ground surface. So water discharges at the surface when the water table is high. If the water table is low, it'll probably remain underground. Sometimes if you have movement along a fault, like if there's an earthquake in the area, it might shove more groundwater to the surface. Um, sometimes those two factors play into each other, and they definitely do in, in Las Vegas. And so some examples of springs in Southern Nevada that are either active today or were recently active. Um, so we used to have a lot more springs in the Las Vegas Valley, but before the construction of the Hoover Dam, where now we get most of our water from the Colorado River, people used to get most of the water around here from uh, the groundwater table. So if you pump water out of the ground faster than you can recharge it with rain, then the springs end up drying up and the water is underneath the surface. Um, so you have two examples here at the top in the black and white photos of these um, historically active spring, uh, spring fed streams. And then this is on the left, a picture of the Gilcrease Spring. Um, some of you might go there to pick pumpkins and apples and things like that. Uh, so there was a spring um, at their, uh, on their property, at least back in the 1920s, but it's since dried up. But then there's also active springs. Uh, there's some up at Corn Creek, but then if you go into Amargosa Valley, which is one valley northwest of here, you have a lot of active springs near Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. But here in Las Vegas Valley, during the Ice Age, you had these widespread groundwater seeps, springs, and wet meadows, so all these different desert wetlands. And these water sources were really important because they supported Ice Age ecosystems. So not only animals that you'd think about, but it supported wetland vegetation. Uh, you also had a mixture of some of the plants you might find on the desert floor, but also with um, pinion pine and juniper trees. You also had megafauna, which are large animals, like um, you had Colombian mammoths, but then also American lions. You also had microfauna, which are things like smaller vertebrates and invertebrates, so like lizards and snakes, but then also little snails and clams and things like that. So how do we know these things about these ancient ecosystems? So unfortunately, we can't just hop in a time machine and go check to see if we're correct. So some of the data that we use to investigate the past come from our observations of the present. So this is a really key principle in geology that the present is key to the past. And that basically describes that you can study modern ecosystems 
and different characteristics about them to interpret past ecosystems that are no longer here. And so one of the things um, that scientists can do is you can examine the sediments of the different deposits of the Las Vegas formation at Tule Springs. You can look at the different little invertebrates that are in there, like spring snail fossils. And then also these are called ostracods. They're um, crustaceans that, um, they're aquatic crustaceans that kind of look like little beans. And so you, by the combinations of the different animals that live in the water, by the combinations of the different sediments that are in there, and then also the presence of fault systems underground, you can reconstruct all these different types of desert wetland environments um, pretty specifically. So not just, oh, there was groundwater, but you can figure out if you had flowing streams, isolated pools, or widespread wet meadows or marshes. And wetlands change through time and space because they're fairly sensitive to climate. Uh, so let's say, uh, like I was saying before, this giant ice sheet shifted our weather pattern down south so we have a lot more rain. Let's say that ice retreats, like how it is today. All that rain goes all the way back up into the Pacific Northwest. It, get much, it gets much drier. That means we have a change in local recharge. So less rain in the area means less recharge. And then that lowers the water table. So you get a change in the type of wetland. All those changes are recorded in the rock record. And so that's how we construct it. Um, so we don't go from the left of the screen over to the right, we go back the other way to tell that story. Um, so that's basically how geoscientists figure this out. So when they do studies like this, they'll produce a figure like I have on the right hand side, which looks very complicated. And what this figure is basically trying to um, summarize is this study was trying to figure out what the rock record of the, of the Las Vegas formation was saying versus what does the global climate record say from the Pleistocene. So the big research question is how did desert wetlands respond to climate change events on the global scale? So basically this figure means that wetlands in the Las Vegas Valley shifted both through time and space. So along the axis of the valley, um, but then also through time. You had different cycles of deposition where the water was high enough to capture sediments and make more rocks. And then you had times where it was a lot more dry and you have erosion and soil formation, which is when you had very little water on the surface. And those are these pink bars represented on here. And they found out that um, these wetland environments responded very rapidly to climate, um, including short-term global rapid warming events. So to kind of clean it up a little bit, toward the top of the screen is the present time. And you have warmer time periods on the right-hand side here on this graph and cooler time periods on the left-hand side. This blue box represents the period of time that ice sheets were at their largest, um, their largest size in most recent time, which was between like 26,000 years ago and about 19,000 years ago. It's called the last glacial maximum. So before and during the last glacial maximum in the Las Vegas Valley, you had widespread marshes and wet meadows. After the ice sheet started to shrink and it started to get a little bit drier and warmer, you started switching off into these spring-fed streams and periods of erosion, soil formation. And then as you get closer and closer to the present day, you have these smaller isolated spring pools. And so all these changes are directly related to changes in climate at the global scale, which is pretty cool. So today, as we all know, we're in the Mojave Desert. It's a very hot and arid environment. So most of our moisture uh, in this area is coming from ephemeral drainage, which is really just every time it rains, the Las Vegas wash floods. So that actually presents a challenge to us preserving fossils here, but that's where most of the water comes from uh, these days anyway. So during the Pleistocene, the fauna or the animal assemblage that was here um, at Tule Springs fossil beds was really interesting and diverse, and it included some animals that are still alive today and others that have gone extinct. So some of these smaller critters represented by fossils from Tule Springs include aquatic species like different fish and pond frogs that lived within the spring water. But then you also have things like lizards, snakes, different species of rodents and bunnies. You also get uh, mollusks like slugs and spring snails and clams, desert tortoise, waterfowl, and then some aquatic rodents. You also get some really interesting carnivores like badgers, coyotes, which are kind of familiar faces around here. But then you also get saber-toothed cats, American lions, pumas, bobcats, and dire wolves. To go into more specifics on these carnivores, some of you might know the dire wolf from Game of Thrones, but real dire wolves, and they were a real species, were just a stockier version of the modern gray wolf. Um, so the large size in the TV show is very exaggerated. 
They weighed up to about 150 pounds and had a really, really strong bite force. Their fossils are represented um, by, this is a portion of uh, one of the bones in the paw, it's called a metapodial, so it'd be one of the bones in the paw. Uh, it's also represented by the patella, which is the kneecap, which would be found right around there on its back leg. So compared to modern gray wolves, they're bigger, but not by a, a huge amount like they are on Game of Thrones. So the American lion is a big cat species that was found here. It's also very rare to find fossils of this carnivore at Chile Springs. This is one of its um, paw bones as well. They're about 25% larger than modern African lions at almost uh, four feet tall and about eight feet long. So compared to the modern lion on the right hand side, they're very, very big. So we had a lot of big cats in the area, including I think some of everyone's favorite, this is in our logo, uh, Smilodon fatalis or the saber tooth cat. A lot of people call them saber-toothed tigers, but they're not really closely related to tigers. Um, but they're called saber-toothed cats because their canine teeth in the upper part of their jaw is super long. It could be up to seven inches long. And so all these different carnivores in the area had to prey on large herbivores called mega herbivores. So we have some familiar faces in here like uh, the pronghorn or American antelope and mule deer, but you also have several species of bison that you can find, Pleistocene horses, giant ground slots, Colombian mammoths, and then also two different types of uh, native camels. So Colombian mammoths are different from woolly mammoths. This is the, the species that I studied for my dissertation research. They're bigger than woolly mammoths and they had a much wider range in North America. Um, so woolly mammoths are found also in uh, Europe and Asia, but Colombian mammoths are only found in North and Central America. And so they're about 13 feet tall at the shoulders, but that's the maximum height for a full grown male. Colombian mammoth, they lived in really large family groups. Um, so you can find a lot of different mixed um, sizes and ages of these mammoths at the monument. And you can also find some really, really cool uh, mammoth tusks. The longest mammoth tusk ever recorded is about 16 feet long, but we'll find juvenile mammoth tusks along with um, adult mammoth tusks and then their molar teeth. This is a lower third molar on uh, this picture right here. So they're pretty big. This is the most common fossil, by the way, found at Tule Springs. The second most common is the North American camel. And so uh, this is a very large camel. They're about seven feet tall at the shoulder. Here's a lower jaw. It's one of the fossils found of the uh, North American camel or camelops. And it's still kind of unsure whether or not they had a hump on their back like dromedary camels, but um, usually their reconstructions are made with kind of a halfway between sort of reconstruction. They're very, very large camels. We did have horses here. So both horses and camels actually evolved in North America um, millions of years before the Pleistocene epoch began. Uh, so both of those types of animals are native to North America originally, but they both went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. So any um, horses that you might see out in the desert like burros or um, wild horses, those are feral animals, meaning they're like wild domesticated animals. So they're not related to the Ice Age horses that were here thousands of years ago. And here's part of its um, foot or hoof bone. You also had giant ground slots, which are similar to tree sloths that you'd see today, um, but the size of a small car. So this is one of the species of ground sloth represented at Tule Springs called the Shasta ground sloth. It's about nine feet long. And uh, sloths like to hang out in caves and their um, preserved dung is often found in Ice Age caves. There are um, Shasta ground sloth dung that included parts of a globe mallow plant, which is this orange flowered plant on the right hand side. Those plants can be found today at Tule Springs. So they're pretty big. And another species of ground sloth is Jefferson's ground sloth, which is a lot larger um, than the Shasta ground sloth. And even though these ground sloths had big giant claws, they were still herb herbivorous animals. So those are mostly for defense purposes. There were also two different species of bison, a longhorn bison called bison latifrons, and then um, a smaller horn species called bison antiquus. Neither one of these are the species that you can find today, which is called bison bison. Uh, those are the bison you see at Yellowstone National Park and then also at Wind Cave National Park um, in the Black Hills region of South Dakota. And so this on the left-hand side is the bison latifrons. So anytime you see a horn core, there's gonna be a very long uh, horn on the end of it that extends out past the bone. And that horn is made out of the same material as your uh, fingernails are. And so bison antiquus and bison latifrons were larger than uh, the bison found today. So you might wonder where did these species go? 
They just evaporated into thin air. Uh, there's several options of what happened to them. Some of them moved upslope. Some of them moved into smaller ranges in other parts of the um, continent. Others went extinct and some are still here. So some of the species that moved upslope into what's called a sky island. Um, so one of the examples of these sky islands is the Spring Mountains, or if you go up to Mount Charleston, you'll see um, pinyon pine and juniper trees as you go into higher elevations where it's cooler. So those species used to exist on the valley floor, but it's just too hot for them to survive down there nowadays. Um, so their, um, their range has kind of shifted upslope in the local area. Some of these species uh, were extirpated, meaning that they were, um, meaning that they were going extinct from a very specific area. So camels actually made their way into South America from North America. And that's why today you still have uh, guanacos and other um, camelids in South America, but not in North America. Some of them went extinct like the Colombian mammoth, uh, as well as giant ground sloths and um, other different species of these megafauna. And so the jury's still out on the ultimate cause of their extinction, but they're no longer around. And some of these species are still here. So you do have um, fossils from lots of different rodents, birds, even large carnivores like mountain lions and coyotes that you still see here in the Mojave Desert today. So some of them are still here. So the paleontology at Tusk is divided into these two major categories of in situ preservation and then also excavation and curation. So in situ preservation is the primary goal of not only the uh, monitoring program of the park, but really the monument wants to preserve as many fossils in situ or in place as possible. And so um, part of the ways that we help promote that are through the monitoring program where every um, so often you go visit these sites, you document any um, any damage from natural processes or human interference like vandalism or unauthorized land use, um, but then also natural processes like erosion and things like that. And you take photographs, you take notes and document all the changes um, to those fossil sites to help preserve them from years to come. And this is Susie Hertfelder. She was the guest scientist prior to me. So some of the fossils have been excavated and curated. A lot of the museum collections developed from this monument so far were excavated because those um, parcels of land were part of um, maybe a major construction project like a power line project. And so if those fossils hadn't been removed from that area, they would have been destroyed by the construction project. Um, so these were salvaged from that area and put into museum collections afterward. Um, so that's not the primary goal of doing paleontology at Tule Springs today because all those fossils are now protected. Um, and so we only remove fossils when they're um, either incredibly vulnerable to mm -hmm. damage where they're just going to be destroyed um, either through natural processes or human interference, uh, or it's a very valuable specimen for research that's incredibly rare to find, like maybe an American lion tooth or something like that. And part of the reason why we limit excavation is because every time you excavate something, you're generating another object in a museum collection. And so this is my supervisor in Eichenberg. She's the Integrated Program Resource Manager. And this is Sally Underwood. She's the curator at the Nevada State Museum. And so any time that you excavate fossils from the ground at Tule Springs, they have to get stored in a museum collection. And because we're a new national monument, we don't have um, permanent buildings or anything with these facilities on the monument at this time. Um, and that's actually a really exciting phase to be in. So since it's the very beginning of this national monument, there's a lot of things to do. And so not only the monitoring program that we're working on, um, but there's a lot of planning underway and trying to figure out uh, what different strategies um, the park is going to use for not only conservation of the natural resources in the park, but also how to integrate that into appropriate public enjoyment and recreation at the park, um, how research is going to be directed, and then also citizen science initiatives involving the community. And so one of the major partners in that has been the protectors of Tule Springs. And I just want to quickly acknowledge them, uh, not only for funding my position actually um, with the Park Service, but also for their support with the monument in not only getting established, but they've been really helpful in putting together uh, outreach programs and organizing volunteers um, to help us out with lots of different programs with that. Um, so that's a, a really cool organization that's been helping the monument since before it was even created. So that's kind of a, an overview of some of the science behind why Tule Springs is a, a national monument and maybe what is to come. 
Uh, so thank you all for listening, and I can take any questions that anyone might have. I've got a couple questions here. Um, can you hear me okay, Lauren? Yes. Okay, just making sure. Um, a couple questions, a couple slides back, actually, and pardon me for uh, waiting so long to ask, but um, um, somebody was asking if that was a um, fossil. That one actually, whoops, uh, pardon me. I th it looks like there was a jaw. Somebody was asking if those were, yeah, yeah is, like, that a, is that a jaw in there? Yeah, so uh, I imagine it's probably a bison jaw based on the size, either bison or camel. Uh, the photo's a little pixelated, so it's hard to tell. But yeah, those are two halves of uh, mandible, so the lower jaw. They are two halves of the same mandible, likely? Two halves of I the same? I don't know. Um, oh. They could be, since they're in association with each other. I would have to, it's hard to see, but I'd have to see if one was the right or the left. If you had two rights, then you'd have two different animals. If you had a right and a left, it'd be possible that it's the same one. How, how can you tell the right from the left? Oh, I guess, I, I'm sorry, That's, that seems like a, I, I guess I, uh... That's a dumb question. No, it's not. Well, they, they curve. Um, they curve inward. Yeah. In, yeah. Okay. I've got uh, some folks with some more interesting questions, though, uh, than that one. Um, oops. I lost it. Um, what uh, the one of the later slides, one of your last slides talked about uh, when you're uh, talking about the protectors uh, mentioned citizen science. Are there opportunities to do citizen science at this stage of the game? Yeah, so um, one of the things that Protectors of Tule Springs helps out with is um, sometimes we have volunteers help out with our monitoring program. Um, uh -huh. So the best way to get in touch with, and the other thing is too, is there are a lot of things that we need help with um, that are larger scale, um, kind of more sporadic citizen science projects where we have people help out with um, invasive, plant, um, invasive plant activities like weed pulling and things like that. Um, so the best way to get in touch with them would be to either connect with them on social media, they have Facebook and everything, uh, or on their website if you look up Protectors of Tule Springs. Um, so there's different levels of, of engagement there, but yeah, they, they do, they participate in kind of um, events that might be more sporadic, or if you're kind of a committed long-term volunteer, some people help out with the monitoring program as well. Cool, yeah, you can reach them at uh, protectorsoftulesprings.org. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then a question uh, that I fielded before the presentation tonight, um, uh, a uh, student was asking me, so, okay, she's interested in paleontology. She's 16, 17 years old, I think, uh, but it's unclear to her how she gets from where she's at now to where you're at. Like, what's the, I guess, uh, the essence of her question was, uh, um, it's a big question, how do you get from here to there? A lot of education, but like, what are the, uh, what's the, what, what, what would be the, if, if, if she was, um, you know, uh, when she graduates from high school, what's the path to getting into paleontology? What are the, I guess, what are the pitfalls? What she, she was asking, like, what, what does she not know what to do right now? She can go to school, she can go to university and, and, and get into the, uh, get into the, into, the, into a program, but. Uh, what do you wish, let me ask it to you this way, what do you wish you had known before uh, going into the thing, going into the program? That's a, that's a I, good question. I really wish I'd written that down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I'd say uh, definitely when you're thinking about college courses, um, so a lot of times people either pick geology or biology. Usually there's no paleontology department at a university because it's an interdisciplinary science. Um, and so it's, Taking classes in background um, and with background in biology and geology are both important. I got my bachelor's degree in biology because my interest in paleo is kind of more on the ecology side than on the geology side. Um, not that geology isn't cool, but so I would recommend taking classes in both disciplines and see what clicks for you. Um, but then also it's really important to focus on developing other skills that are applicable to a lot of different types of positions that you'd be in, uh, especially reading and writing. And so writing is really important in communicating science, um, it not only in reports that you might have to write for a future job, but then also uh, in communicating your research at conferences to other scientists, but then also to, to other people outside of your discipline. Uh, so definitely uh, sharpening up on writing skills and then also uh, geology and biology. Um, one of the things that I found really helpful uh, kind of going into the path of grad school was getting as much experience as I could 
with any organization I could find that did any kind of internship or volunteering. Um, it's difficult in some parts of the country to find that kind of exposure where you live. I actually had to spend two summers in Philadelphia uh, to the kind of experience, but my family lived there as well. Um, so yeah, getting volunteer experience I think is important too. Um, I ended up going for my PhD. You don't have to get a PhD to be a paleontologist. A lot of paleontologists um, either have bachelor's or master's degrees. Uh, there's lots of different fields you could get into within paleontology, including um, museum education, uh, fossil preparation, and, and running uh, paleontology prep labs. Uh, and then there's also field scientists. So I tend to gear more towards the field side, but there's other ways to be a paleontologist where you don't have to go hiking around either. So if that's not your thing, uh, there are people who devote their entire careers to studying specimens within museum collections indoors. And um, so there's lots of different options um, of what you can do with that sort of field. So I actually didn't know as much about the field part of it until I was older. And that's definitely the thing that's really clicked with me. So just trying to get, I guess, as much volunteer experience or exposure as possible by reaching out to any organizations in your area that might have opportunities for you. Groovy, groovy. Um, Cindy on Facebook is asking, uh, what's the progress of the Ice Age Park? Mm. I, I guess so, it's just like, uh, I guess everything's kind of still being built, right, or formed? Yeah. Yeah, so Without? for those of you who don't know, I'm going to highlight the state park with my laser pointer. So there is a parcel of state park land within the National Monument in the southeast end of it um, called Ice Age Fossil State Park. And so they're uh, an important partner with Tule Springs Fossil Bits National Monument. Um, so their visitor center is currently under construction. Um, I don't know when they're expected to be open, but I'd imagine it would be at some point next year. Um, and so they've had several trail building events to uh, currently because of uh, COVID and everything, they aren't doing uh, large public gatherings or anything, uh, but I definitely check out their Facebook page too. They post updates fairly regularly. Groovy. And then uh, the last question I have down here is uh, what, so uh, some folks were looking at the, uh, the images of the, the megafauna, the bison, uh, the dire wolves, even though the dire wolf isn't as big as it is on TV. Um, yeah. you know, those bison were huge. The camels were huge, especially the ground sloth. Why were those, why were those animals so uh, much larger back then than they were today? That's a great question. Um, so body size is definitely one of the main uh, huge characters that has an impact uh, on an animal's life. Uh, and so one of the things that a large body size is actually pretty advantageous for is retaining body heat. Um, so just to do just to do a little math, um, you know, when you calculate area, you do like length times width. So that's a square measurement. When you do volume, length times width times height, that's a cubic measurement. So anytime you increase body size of an animal, the area increases by a factor of two, the volume increases by a factor of three. So you become a much better heat sink. Um, so this very large bison would probably retain body heat much better than a smaller bison, which would have been helpful if the overall temperature of the area was a lot cooler. Um, so that would help with um, heat retention. There are other, reasons for being large. Being large also protects you from getting eaten. Uh, so even large carnivores like the American lion, I'm going to skip back to it. It was way back here. Do, 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 do. I'm going to go back to this little tableau that I have. That shows the fauna as a whole. So you can even see these wolves eating a carcass over here. You have these saber toothed cats kind of hiding in the grass. And so large body size, especially in something like a mammoth, ends up protecting you from getting eaten. Um, carnivores will like to put as little energy as possible into taking down prey. Because if you're thinking about, if you have to chase after an animal, that takes a lot of calories to chase them. Um, so it's a lot easier to take down something smaller. So large body size is also uh, an adaptation to prevent yourself from getting eaten. Um, so those are just a couple of factors of why large body size might have been more advantageous at the time. Um, it also might have been a factor in making them extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, at least at, uh, at Rancho La Brea, like in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, coyotes were super successful um, after a lot of the other larger animals went extinct. So I, I guess it turned out that smaller bodied animals ended up uh, 
winning at the end of the Pleistocene anyway. Ah, that's fascinating. Fascinating. Um, had uh, actually one more question came through. Uh, somebody saw the the slide of the uh, Columbian mammoth with those giant tusks, those giant. You said they were sixteen feet long. These ones in yeah. particular, I don't think so. But yeah, the the record is sixteen feet. Those are probably like eleven. I'm just guesstimating. That this is a picture from uh, La Brea Tar Pits. Those are curved in on each other like that. Is that? Does that provide an advantage or uh, like why? I, we, I guess um, we don't see, uh, you know, elephants with tusks that kind of curve in on each other like that. Does that, uh, was there a purpose for that that you know I of? Should, I should ask my friend, Stephen. He's, he's one of the scientists that, that goes to museums all around the world. Uh, so different elephant species. So mammoths are in the same family as elephants that are alive today. Um, so tusks are incisor teeth. And anytime you have something that's gonna grow like a tooth or a fingernail or a follicle of hair, it's kind of like a pasta machine, like whatever <laughs> shape the hole is that it's growing out of is gonna determine, uh, whatever angle it's growing at is gonna ter- determine the shape of what it ends up being. So there's lots of different species of elephants that you'll see different curvature in their tusks. Uh, typically what you see today in like African elephants, they tend to be straighter uh, part of that depends on different species of elephants just have different um, shapes within their tusks. Male Colombian mammoths, uh, just like male elephants, fought with each other over females. And so maybe the, the curvature of the tusk would have been advantageous to, to fight with the other males. There's actually two mammoth skulls that were found locked together and the males died fighting each other like that. Um, so part of it might be combat related. But yeah, that curvature just comes from the angle that the tooth is growing out of the um, the tooth socket, which is in their skull. I'll highlight it with my laser pointer. And usually you'll see one side is either a little bit longer than the other or curves slightly differently. And that's because just like people, um, they're like right tusk or left tusk. And they'll use their tusk, they'll, they'll use their tusks as tools um, sometimes to dig for water underground, um, they'll use them for fighting so they can use their, their tusks as tools. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, that, uh, that's what I have for Q and a, um, any, any final, uh, thoughts or, um, I think we, we've, we've, uh, I think if uh, we mentioned if uh, folks want to get more involved up at Tule Springs to visit the protectors, uh, protectors of Tule Springs dot org. Um, is there a way folks can get a hold of you if they have other questions? Yes, I am going to go to my first slide because it's going to take me way too long to go all the way back to the beginning by clicking through. Uh-huh. Can you see my screen again? Uh, not yet. Okay, I might have to do the present now again. How about now? Bingo, there we are. Okay, I don't know if this little bar, here I'll move it. Um, so my email is down here, it's lauren underscore parry at partner.nps.gov. And that's parry with an A, not an E. So like, not like Katy Perry, so it's Lauren Parry. Uh, otherwise the email will bounce. But that's my email if you'd like to reach out to me in the future and ask me any questions. Groovy, that's awesome. All righty, Lauren. Well, uh, thank you for this is a fascinating information. I I had such a uh, I had such a <laughs> I got so engrossed in your presentation, kind of looking at all the slides and and the, and the charts. I'm a charts guy uh, that yeah. I almost uh, forgot to be monitoring for questions. So it's uh, oh. <laughs> it sucked me in. Good job. Yeah, uh, I'm excited. To, this was fun. It's it's always fun to reach out to to different groups that are interested in natural history and all sorts of stuff like that. Public land. Well, you know, Southern Nevada is a, a wild place. Uh, you know, you, if, there's things to do in every single direction you go from Las Vegas. So uh, this is an area, you know, our, our group, we talk about Sloan a lot, uh, but uh, we love uh, sharing uh, you know, information on other public lands as well. So thank you very much for, uh, for uh, uh, talking to us this evening. And uh, that'll uh, wrap it up for now. Um, again, protectors of uh, tulisprings.org if you want to know more about uh, what's happening over there. Uh, if you want to know uh, more about what's happening at Sloan Canyon, you can reach us at friendsofsloan.org. 
Uh, you're welcome to uh, volunteer and uh, get sweaty with us over the summer under the tent or get sweaty with us doing trail work, trail monitoring once uh, uh, the weather cools down uh, in, in the months after the summer and the months ahead. All righty. With that, we'll call it an evening. Uh, enjoy, everybody, um, and have a good night. Thank you.